Uh, Rachel McGuire is the research director at the Institute for the Future, uh, which is a very eminent, long-standing institution out here in Silicon Valley that has had an enormously good track record looking at what is going to happen in the future, which is what Rachel is going to try to help us understand when it comes to healthcare. Uh, well, that is a tough and lofty uh, <laughs> challenge. You know, I, I was thinking last week when I finally was able to sit down and think what in the 10 minutes or so that I have here, what would be the key idea that I'd try to offer up as, as my contribution to this conversation to such a really remarkable group of leaders and doers in health and tech spaces. And so I reread the agenda that Taconomy had put together, and there's this question that's in my overview that says, where is all this data analytics in the cloud taking us? And that question made me think of that line that's often attributed to Marshall McLuhan, the social philosopher. It says, you know, we shape our tools, and thereafter our tools shape us. And so if we're willing to submit that our work here today and in these kind of conversations is to figure out not just the tools we're shaping, but how we can anticipate they're going to shape us as people or as par participants in this health and healthcare space, then you know, I think that, that asks a different question. And, and I think what I'll offer up today is really a thought experiment for you all to think about if, to, if right now what we're doing is shaping the tools, we've got some of the leaders in the room who are in the business of shaping these tools, figuring out what the tools are going to look like. And as we release them into the wild, which is to say as we put them in our hands, how is that going to shape the way we confer authority and expertise in health and medicine over the next decade? That's my question for you all, and I'm going to unpack that a little bit with some of the ideas at the Institute for the Future that we've been playing around with. So to do that, I'm going to throw out this name, Abraham Flexner. Now, for the physicians in the room, anyone who studied public health in the United States, US trained physicians, I should say, this name means a lot to you. For those of you who've never heard of him, here's the quick history. Uh, in the early 20th century, the Carnegie Foundation, the American Medical Association reached out to Carnegie Foundation and said, can you look into the allegedly deplorable situation of medical education in the United States? So Abraham Flexner was an American educator at the time, and what he did is he led a group that investigated all 155 medical schools that were in operation in the early 20th century. And his report verified the allegations that everyone already knew about at the time, that medical education in the United States was absolutely deplorable. There are all these famous stories from the report of uh, dissecting rooms that were also used as chicken yards. Um, one of the most notorious stories that's always told is he asked a Harvard professor in the med medical school, why don't you provide written exams? And the professor responded, well, fewer than half of my students can read or write, so there's no need to test them through written exams. So anyway, after he wrote this very comprehensive report, uh, it had a lasting impact on how we think about how we train medical, how we train doctors today, and then also what it did to our policies. So in other words, over half of the medical schools that were in, in operation at the start of the 20th century were shut down. That included, by the way, uh, medical schools that were directed at women, directed for women or open to women, and also uh, directed people of color. But the more, I think, most lasting and transformative impact that the Flexner Report had is it also did, it passed all our, it created state boards, so it passed all the laws that create state medical boards, and it also passed the laws that have to do with strict licensing and credentialing in medicine. So when you think about what that did as those laws went through, is it did three things. It determined how and, well, it determined first how we become doctors. Then it determined who, and who is very critical over the next 10 years, not what, but who has the right to certify an illness, and who, again, not what, can dictate what the treatment of standard of care and the protocol will be for an illness. And so in many ways, you could argue that what the Flexner Report did is it set what, what, what's called structural authority, or what T.T. Patterson, the British scholar, calls sapiential authority. We conferred all our knowledge-based authority to physicians. 
And I think when you look over at the next 10 years and you look at how these new emerging tech, this, or this health tech ecosystem that Techonomy calls it, how things like AI, how things like blockchain, Internet of Things, how they are actually generating new knowledge. David Weinberger calls it new forms of knowing, right? How do we start to unpack this sapiential authority that we've given to physicians and spread some of that knowledge base authority to other entities, including, in this case, objects moving forward. So what the Institute has done is we've sort of identified these four new sources of authority. And the first one we call computational authority. Now you could think about this on a number of ways. I think the easiest way to get into it is to look at Max Little's work at MIT around the Parkinson's Voice Initiative. So for those of you who don't know about Dr. Little's work, he's essentially using the microphone on a smartphone, digital microphone, he's using voice recognition software, and he's using machine learning. And through that, he built an algorithm that can essentially determine where you are on a spectrum of illness to health, to healthy, when it comes to Parkinson's voice, or when it comes to Parkinson's. And he can do that by, uh, by getting a sample of your voice. So in other words, his algorithm can anticipate where you are in a way that right now we depend, as you, as you all know, on uh, observational diagnosis. You know, we put people through a series of tests, and then the human eye and human tests are able to determine what, what your risk for Parkinson's is or where you are on the spectrum. So in our minds, you know, Dr. Little, he's not an MD. He's the first one to say he doesn't know anything about Parkinson as a, as a biological or neurological disease. He says, I'm an applied mathematician. And in my mind, this was a math problem. And you know, Microsoft calls cancer a, a, pro, a, a computer problem, right? They think they're going to be able to solve cancer in 10 years, and they're taking a real computational approach to it. They just opened their first wet lab, I think, last summer, right? So this type of computational authority in our minds is one of, one of these spaces that is emerging over the next decade. It's being shaped by these technologies that we're seeing. And the question is, from a structural authority point of view, how are we going to make space for that kind of authority to participate in health and medicine? Now, there are three other authorities that I'm not going to spend too much time going into because I really just wanted to provoke you all to think about how these new tools will shape authority. But I think they're worth mentioning, particularly given what happened last night. The second authority that we see coming along with these new technologies is that of networked authority. Who or what has the, has the understanding, knows how to activate networks, whether they're people or devices, to get them to do something that we all want to do. I mean, too often we talk about behavior change like an individual problem, where really when, with the real effective change agents and questions of behavior change are those who understand how to get networks of people, how to move important nodes to influence and nudge groups of people to change their behavior. So we see this notion of networked authority playing out first in things like clinical research. You know, when you look at who's having success in clinical trials, how they fundamentally revolutionized, how quickly you can get a clinical trial together. I mean, some of the work that Stanford's doing with Apple Health Kit has changed the game in terms of how quickly you can put together um, a research study. And then there's ambient authority. And I think this really picks up where that last panel just let off. You know, when we think about Internet of Things in the future, it's not so much Am you know, what's been fascinating to watch about the Amazon Echo is not what health systems are doing with it, but what people in their homes have done with it. They brought the Echo in for entertainment purposes or whatever brought it to their home. But when you read the reviews and you start to see how many caregivers are using the Echo as a, fun, as a tool so that for, their, for the person who's aging in home. So someone who's aging in home or who needs care at home, who has not been able to turn on the lights in his or her room for the last 20 years with an Echo that's hooked up to their previously Philips Hue light, can now do all of these activities on their own. They can turn on the TV. They can access information that they want, all using verbal this voice recognition. That wasn't a, they don't list it as a health tool when you do ethnographic research and you ask people to tell, the, tell you what, what tools they have in their house that they use for health. They don't list things like the Echo on first glance, but when you ask them, 
how do you use that device? More often than not, if they're managing a chronic disease, they're using their digital technologies as critical health tools. So we look at that ambient authority. How are we going to confer ambient authority to these devices and to people like designers who really understand how to move the needle in environmental and social determinants of health? And then the final source of authority is that of uh, narrative authority. And we've actually drawn a lot of inspiration from Eric Topol's work, especially the uh, commencement speech you gave at Baylor after you yourself were a patient. And you, know, you talked about uh, in an era of, of big data, in an era with labs and tests and all sorts of more information than we can ever imagine, you know, the, the real trick will be to, the true authority will come from who gets to tell the story? When are we truly going to confer authority, narrative authority, to people, not patients, not consumers, do it people, so that they tell their story? And it's their story that has the authority. Because at that point, then maybe we've taken all of these emerging technologies and we figured out a way to confer authority and expertise to the individual so that they will make the choices that make sense for them when it comes to their health. So those are the four sources of authority that we think are really, that will be shaped and shape us as we shape these technologies. Computational authority, networked authority, ambient authority, a narrative authority. So if I come back to that first question of where, where it's all going to take us over the next 10 years, I suppose my snarky response is to $4 trillion, or 4.2. I mean, why not, right? We can just keep spending. Um, but I think until we figure out how we're going to change our understanding of expertise and knowledge in the space, and we're going to give way to confer authority to other entities, new entities that align with these emerging tech, then we're just going to create duplicate systems. We're just going to basically do what we did with the, the home pregnancy test. Women, we all now get to take our own pregnancy test at our home. We get to find out the information on our own. But the first thing our physician does is redo that test the second we get into the office. So I think we really run a risk of a future. Thank you. Where, where, uh, we really run, a, run the risk of a future where we have a connected pregnancy test in our home, but our physician, for legal reasons or whatever else reasons, may then, the second we enter into their health system, rerun that test and redo everything we did at home so we've got these duplicate systems, and that's how we get to $4 trillion in 10 years. So that's our risk. If we don't start to take seriously how we shape authority along with shaping these tools, I think we get ourselves an incredibly tech savvy but also incredibly expensive health system. That was my that was my idea for the for the morning. Thanks.